the notion of Hindu fascism come from? Hindu fascism is a term that I learned in a book uh, by um, the book called The Light at the Center by Agehananda Bharati, Swami Agehananda Bharati. Now, he is something of a privileged witness. He was an uh, Indology student in the Nazi period in Nazi Germany. And so when the um, Nazi regime had to deal with the uh, Subhash Bos coming in, he was immediately employed as a go-between between the uh, the Indian troops and and the Germans. So he um, he certainly learned the trade hands-on. He had very important experience. But so later in India, he became a monk, made himself at home there, and he um, he wrote some interesting things. So uh, he gave his opinion about something that he called Hindu fascism, by which he meant nothing more deep than the fact that Hitler had a certain popularity in India. Uh, and mind you, a uh, different popularity than the, uh, well, anti-Jewish popularity that he had in the Muslim world. In India, it was a totally different uh, phenomenon. Namely, most Hindus, of course, knew that he was the enemy of the British and so on. That, that endeared him. The, the uh, enemy of an enemy of a friend, then um, that he had the reputation of being celibate, which was not really true. He had this mistress, Eva Brown, but German propaganda kept that secret. So they thought he was bachelor. Then the swastika, of course. He was also reputed to be a vegetarian. So he, he fits the, uh, the image of a Hindu hero rather well. And so then, then Germany as such had a great sympathy in India because German scholars were reputed to, uh, have dug up, uh, Sanskrit sources and so on. Max Müller, like the, the German cultural center in Delhi is called the Max Müller Bhavan. So that, that whole aura, was there and had a certain effect. He also means something else by that, namely the uh, phenomenon of Hindu nationalism. Uh, we can discuss that in a separate video tomorrow. So that that is now, of course, also very common to speak of Hindu nationalism as Hindu fascism. And so we'll discuss that, but not today. What is now meant by that term is uh, something more profound, namely that Hinduism somehow is, is the basis of National Socialism, or at least has some deep kinship with it. And so that is also something you find like in, in Christian pamphlets, for example. If they have to heap up uh, hate against Hinduism, then this Hitler connection comes in very fine. So that's what, like for instance, uh, Audrey Tushke, a very uh, well certified Hindu hater. You see, she sees the point when Narendra Modi unveiled this statue for Subhash Chandra Bose. So she immediately made a connection. Ah, Bose was a Nazi collaborator. And then there is this famous photograph of uh, Bose shaking hands with Hitler. And so that's right there. And so that, that is supposed to prove that there is some deep connection. Now, in the history, there are connections with all kinds of people. You see, in practical politics, you make strange alliances. 
that doesn't mean there's a deep connection. And so what we're going to look into today is whether there is a deep connection. You know, is there something profoundly present in Hinduism that shades over into National Socialism that, that found its expression even in National Socialism? Some people uh, claim this. Agehananda Bharati uh, is, is quite interesting because he's at an important historic crossroads, not just when as a student he became a translator and so on, no, but also 20, 30 years later when, when India is all the hype in the West. When Maharishi Mahesh Yoga received the Beatles as a uh, pupil and so on. Uh, so at that point, you see, he also becomes active as, a, as an influential writer. And so there he describes the, um, the scene at that time where yeah, Hindu fascism also gets a, a more moderate meaning, but for him also a nasty meaning, namely, you see, many people who were interested in me at the time were hippies, were anti-authoritarian, were anti the influence of their parents, were certainly anti the, uh, the military influence in the United States during the Vietnam War. And so he, he gives a real life episode of the visit by Mahalisi Mahesh Yogi to the United States. And so there he has an audience of these, you know, hippie type of uh, fans of his. And, you know, they, someone asked, you know, what is, what should be the right relation to, 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 between us and our parents? And he answers, well, your parents are God. Uh, you should, you know, revere them and, you know, treat them greatly and obey them and so on. My God, that didn't go down well in that anti-authoritarian audience. Then uh, they ask, you know, about the draft. The draft meaning the fact that young men are forcibly recruited into the American army at that time. And um, so what about joining the army? That's the question. And so he says, well, you see, your your country... Is, is your father. You have to follow him. You know, if your father calls you to help, you have to do it. So if if uh, army recruitment calls you, well, then you have to go into the army. So this is quite the opposite of what that whole audience is thinking. Now, this also recalls into fascism, not in the strong sense of fascism, but at least in the sense of the side of the authority. So he says that traditional Hinduism is on the side of the authority. It teaches you obedience. And so that's very much against the spirit of the times in the West at the moment. That's also a, a solved but sometimes lethal form of, you know, what he calls Hindu fascism. At any rate, it means that you have to go to the army and go fight for someone you don't know and die. For yeah, what for? You know, just because uh, Hindu Dharma tells you to obey. So you know that's also his contribution. So he was this uh, this well laid back fellow, like uh, like I'll say something about him that Hindus won't like. You know, he says that as an ordained monk. Uh, of course, it should be a, a role model of what a Hindu should be. It's certainly not eat beef. Well, he says, I eat many a good steak. And you see, he's supposed to be celibate. But at the time, he had some kind of, uh, I think, Japanese girlfriend. And, and so on. I mean, it was because, of course, the duty of a monk is to be free. <laughs> That's, that's his duty. You see, he should be unattached. Therefore, in his opinion, well, you see, you can, you can do what you want. And so that I think is not the Hindu idea of freedom. So he's a bit, uh, a bit special, 
but he was a very good observer and he knew a lot. And so in that sense, as a source of information, he's very good. His uh, definition of enlightenment should also be noted to different topics, but I'll mention it just in a sentence. Namely, he says, uh, the light at the center is a, a zero experience. He says, you see what the whole stuff about uh, sadhana is about, is about getting the zero experience. Then there are different schools of uh, philosophy and so on built around this. So the zero experience is essentially the same, yet the Buddhists have one explanation for it, and the Vedantins have another, and the Sankhya people have another. Uh, but what it's really about is this zero. So you see, that's a, a bit of a, a view like uh, beyond philosophy, you know, emphasizing the wordless thing, which was also in the spirit of the times. You see, this, this sort of distrust towards uh, settled philosophies, certain systems. Are the Vedic rishis like the Nazis? in preparing rural scenery, as Johannes Bronkhorst alleges? Yes, in the context of his uh, <laughs> thesis of a greater ma Magadha, that is what he has uh, said offhand, and it became a topic of debate in the context of the conference in Edmonton, I think two years ago, about precisely his greater Magadha thesis. So the greater Magadha thesis is essentially that there is another source of culture in India than the Vedic area in Haryana. There, there may be several, but so the one that he is talking about is uh, in Magadha, in what is now Bihar. And so from that center of culture uh, issued both Buddhism and Zionism. And um, and then you can argue that even Sankhya and Vedanta had something to do with it, owed something to it. Uh, but so at any rate, Buddhism is not indebted to Vedic tradition according to him. And so this he explains with this separate greater Magadha culture. So that's a bit controversial. It need not be because you find exactly the same in Sri Tantalagiri, who very much defends uh, Hindu positions, uh, where he simply points out, well, that the Vedic tradition is just one tradition among several. And so it's perfectly legitimate that there is a greater Magadha and that it has its own emphasis. Okay, fine. Now, uh, in that context, he uses as a proof that the Buddhist culture was clearly urban culture. It has an urban background, whereas the Vedic people do not. <laughs> so he makes this comparison with a Nazi art exhibition in München in 1937 namely one where not a single word depicted or industrial life or urban life. They all had an idealized rural setting. So this idealization of, of this rural uh, scenery by a culture that was very industrial. Germany at the time was like the world leader in industrial innovation. That that struck uh, Johannes Bronkhorst as something also <laughs> present in the Vedic culture, in the culture depicted at least by the Rigveda. And um, as had later other scholars have commented, well, one reason why they um, they focused on the rural scenery, is that they lived in a rural scenery. You see, in Germany, this is remarkable because this is a very advanced industrial culture, yet they all depict uh, the countryside. 
whereas uh, <laughs> the way they think people just depicted what they lived through. Uh, in this uh, connection, of course, you can ask why do the cities not figure in the Vedic culture? And here we come to an important argument in the uh, homeland debate. Uh, was the Harappan culture Vedic? Well, an important argument against it is precisely that the Harappan culture was, of course, urban, you know, generated in many cities, was unique, was very advanced in this respect. And yet, the Rigveda doesn't. Now, the, the whole debate was revived from the Indian side in 1982. Mind you, the Art of India theory is much older. It dates from the 18th century, and it started in Europe, not in India. But so it was revived in 1982 by K.D. Setana in his book Karpasa in ancient India. Karpasa means cotton. And so his thesis is that cotton is very much present in the Harappan cities. Yet it is not mentioned in the Rig Veda. And that he explains by an anteriority of the Rig Veda. You see, in, in, in the post Harappan period, which of course exists, and according to the Aryan invasionists, that's when the Aryans came into India. You see, the use of cotton had not suddenly disappeared, even though people had ceased living in cities. And so, in that case, if that's when the Vedic people had come into India, they would have had cotton all over the place. And yet, they don't. Why? Because they're anterior to the Harappan city. So, in, in Satan's dating, the, uh, the Vedic people lived in like 3000 BC. Now, that's also what, uh, what Sri Kantalagiri says. That's also what the astro, the archaeo astronomical data in the Vedic literature point out. You see that that is about the chronology, like uh, family books in about 3000 BC. And um, so that's a perfectly uh, natural explanation then for the Vedic people not being urban. Though, you see, I mean, I have a room for a scenario where they live a bit later. India was still a big place, and even though there were some cities, there were still a lot of other places too, where the Vedic people as uh, cattle tenders uh, were more at home. So, at any rate, there is nothing problematic about the rishis being focused on rural scenery, there's absolutely nothing Nazi about it. Thank you, Dr. L. The, the next question is, is Hinduism the root of Nazism, as Sheldon Pollock has alleged? Did Hitler also think so? Well, the last question is the easiest. Hitler hated India. And he's quite explicit about that, though not very... Uh, very loquacious because I mean he says his point <laughs> very firmly and that will do. And there are of course also testimonies by others that he gave a very negative opinion of the Hindus that he met, and especially of Subhash Chandra Bose. Though in his meeting with Bose he was fairly diplomatic, though much less so than his foreign minister von Ribbentrop who was very flattering to Bose as well. And, and tried also, he prepared his uh, talks, you know, he knew about India and what nerve to touch with uh, Bose. So Hitler was quite blunt, but nevertheless, not as blunt as he was behind his back. And so uh, <coughs> he had no good opinion about this, uh, this Indian army. Then, more fundamentally, he uh, spoke, of course, in favor of the, uh, the Aryan invasion theory, and he applied it 
to explain the nature of the Indian people. He said, well, you see, they are the miserable, unfortunate result of the mixing of our superior Aryan blood with that of these uh, aboriginals. And so the result is that they are some kind of second Jewry, Jewish race. He says that very explicitly. He makes that that comparison very explicit. The Indians are like the Jews. And that is not meant as a compliment in the mouth of Hitler, as you can see. So, uh, so at any rate, you see there, there the result of Einwanderung, of uh, immigration, and then mixing. And so, you see, he, he doesn't want to be reminded. And the whole idea that the Aryans could have been <laughs> brown and then penetrating into a white territory was totally foreign to him. Okay, so that much for Hitler. Hitler was not a lover of India. Uh, now, um, Pollock's thesis is, uh, well, a bit special. Well, it's not a bit special. In fact, it only explicitates what most Indologists do. I mean, the, the Aryan invasion theory became general around 1860. And so ever since, most scholars have never known anything else. And even till today, they assume that the homeland was somewhere in, uh, in, uh, in Russia, Ukraine, Kazakhstan perhaps, but at any rate, not India. And that ever necessarily Sanskrit May, can have come in India only by immigration, violent or non-violent, but at any rate, immigration. So he's also one of those. And so when you read what he says about uh, this immigration and so on, um, he himself has no idea that it could be otherwise, but he, he does know about the art of India for maybe, <laughs> because he attributes it totally falsely to the Nazis. And so this is completely uh, at variance with not just what Hitler said, but what was taught in the Nazi school books. I mean, Rassenkunde, you see, race science was a very important topic in Nazi schools and in Nazi culture in general. And so there is no such Nazi textbook that teaches that the origin was in India. Of course not. Um, so he does say that here and there, though he also, there are, there is an exception in his text. So clearly he, um, this is, he's on unsure ground. Anyway, you know, about that, you know, we're used to people thinking that there was an Aryan invasion and all that. We won't fuss too much about it, but he goes a lot farther than that. You see that uh, idea that the Nazis thought something wrong about the invasion scenario. That's only to help build a more serious case, a, a deeper connection, a more essential connection. And so he links Nazism to inegalitarianism as well as the racism that in his eyes are inherent in the Dharma Shastra. And so according to him of course the caste system that is codified in the in the Dharma Shastras is a racist system, is a racial apartheid system which he assumes, which was a very popular opinion. Again, that's not so much his personal contribution. But so it's racial and it's, it's anti-egalitarian. Now, of course, it's not quite egalitarian. It does indeed say that the different Varnas are in a hierarchy. That there is an enormous difference, steep difference between 
a pure varna or a person of pure varna versus someone of mixed varna, which greatly, I mean, which constantly rang a bell in Germany where you also have a category of Mischlinge or the mixed people, you know, meaning mixed between German and Jewish, half Jewish, you know, they were Mischlinge. Now they're, they're judged quite negatively in the Manus Mutu. So that makes him think of, well, a connection between the Nazi ideology and the Dharma Shastra. The Dharma Shastras are mainly linked with the um, Mimansa school, Guru Mimansa. So that's like the, the most uh, orthodox Brahminical school. That is not so much into metaphysics or so. In fact, in a certain perspective, you can see it as an atheist school. But it's very serious about the rules of Vedic ritual and so on, and about the rules of social codes. Now, these two ideas of uh, race and uh, equality. You now let's look at these in philosophy. Uh, about race, of course, it's a complete mistake. There is no race, uh, no concept of race in the whole Hindu doctrine of caste. Caste is not, is not a racial thing. And um, even though castes have come to be defined by birth, nevertheless, there is no phenotypical aspect to race. It is not defined that you see Brahmins are white and Kshatriyas are brown or so, which many Europeans actually have thought for long. Uh, no, you see, once you are a racial group, well, you remain amongst yourselves. And so yes, that is ultimately going to strengthen and strengthen the, the racial separateness. Nevertheless, race is not the basis. Uh, so that's a complete mistake, but again, you see a, a very common one. That's what European Indology used to think. Then about uh, inequality. Well, of course, inequality existed in many societies. And indeed, in, uh, in pre-modern society in many places, certainly in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, there was plenty of slavery. So, before we talk about inequality in the caste system, let's first uh, realize carefully that we're speaking from a Western perspective originally that is thoroughly familiar with the inequality of slavery as well as other inequalities, the inequality of, the, of the, the nobility versus the commoners, for example, the privileged position of the clergy and, all, you know, all kinds of inequalities, but so aggravated by that particular form of inequality that is slavery. So <laughs> compared to that, you see, Hinduism didn't have that. So that's fairly gentle. And when Shivaji in the 17th century rebels against the Mughal Empire, one thing he does is to abolish slavery. Now, which is you know, quite remarkable. I mean, Americans have Abraham Lincoln as the emancipator of the slaves. Well, Hindus have Shivaji as the emancipator of the slaves. A, a slave system that they themselves didn't even impose, that had been imposed upon them. So in terms of the very, very basic forms of equality, I think Hinduism has done a good job. But yes, yes, the caste system is uh, is full of inequalities. That is true. That, that should not be denied. And so while well, the details of that can be discussed left and right, 
you see this basic principle i think ought simply to be accepted yes it was an in egalitarian system however the the shastrakaras the, the the makers of the law codes have not erred in doing that at least beyond what other civilizations have done I mean, there was inequality in Europe too. Equality, at least equality before the law, had to be conquered step by step by step with, with fallbacks and so on. So that's a very slow process with which apparently now, uh, Western indologists want to, uh, judge, uh, Hinduism. But even then, you see, regardless of all the um, protocol improprieties in picking up another society, uh, or just sinew equality, as if you have no history of that sin yourself. Okay, accepting all that, fact remains that that's not national socialism. You see, First of all, the Nazis didn't need the Hindu example for that, because if they want to learn about inequality, it was everywhere. And indeed, what they did in, in, in Europe was not what the Hindu scriptures described. You know, what they did in Europe or wanted to do in Europe if they had won the war was what the colonial power had been doing in their colonies. So uh, they wanted to be poor people. You see, those who were out of place in their opinion, they wanted to just uh, so forth. And um, they wanted a, a population policy. They wanted to stimulate the birth rate among the favored races. And so they wanted to repopulate the choicest areas with their own people. Just like you had a British settlement in parts of uh, South Africa, in uh, Rhodesia, Zimbabwe, and the Americas that became Canada and the United States. So, so I mean, colonization has made a lot of difference, and that's what Hitler also wanted to do in his living space, his uh, projected Lebensraum in Poland, Ukraine, Russia. So all the bad things he wanted to do there, he didn't need the Indian example for. Either there were European examples for them. Or, you know, if you wanted per se to find them elsewhere, you could find them, for instance, in the Bible, where the Assyrian Empire at one point takes up the population of uh, Israel and deports them to what is now Kurdistan, so northern Iraq, where they dissolve into the population, so they've not been physically killed, but disappeared somehow. So you see, that's the type of policy that Hitler has in mind. When it comes to exterminating the Jews, that's a later policy that only came about in 1441. That was not planned ahead. That that was partly through war circumstances. That's not the the result of a philosophical choice. It's another reason why this does not stem from Hinduism. But so the decisive reason why it doesn't stem from Hinduism is that there is no genocide there. You see, whatever ugly features may be present in the caste system. It do, never exterminates people. It doesn't really enslave the lowest castes because they can always go. They don't like it. You see, nobody stops them. And um, at any rate, their life is, is saved. I mean, it's, it's a way of living together. And so it's a very unequal way of living together, but it does not involve <laughs> genocide. So to deduce genocide from anything Hindu, well, that's, uh, yeah, that, that clearly is agenda driven. The evidence does not suggest that, but Pollock's agenda 
makes it probable. And he is quite candid about it. You see, he wrote this during the Ayodhya affair. And so the Hindus were misbehaving. I mean, what is this, you see? A man in their own temple, you know, that's not very obedient. And so the Hindus had to be punished. They had to be shown their place. So, you know, this idea of throwing them to be the root of, of uh, national socialism, now that's a good kind of thing. Well, you see, it's not like that. Hinduism is not the root of Nazism, certainly not in any way that uh, Pollock construes. Now, this um, became a, uh, a, a topical affair in India, something controversial, thanks to the circumstance that Pollock was precisely chosen to be head of the um, the Indic library that the company Infosys would start financing. And so it is the uh, merit of Raji Malhotra to show publicly that you know, this, <laughs> this won't wash, you see. Somebody with that record can hardly be the, uh, the director of a very important cultural project involving Hindu heritage. And so I think that that is, that is, that is very correct. You know, with a record like that, this is not something you should take up unless, unless you see, I, I believe in the power of people to change, to convert. You know, this is after all uh, about 30 years ago. So maybe he changed his mind. You see, he could easily come up and say, yeah, it's not true that Hinduism is the, the source of national socialism. I wrote such a thing, but it was a mistake. It was in circumstances, blah, blah, blah. I grew out of it. He could easily do that, but so far he hasn't. And so I think that's uh, rather impolite of him. It's also rather, well, typical for the situation in India that on the one hand, some Hindus or Hindu secularists are militantly defending him. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a matter of freedom of speech, you see, that you could choose him rather than someone else. And, and so the Hindus who have originally shown what the problem is, well, they turn out not to have the power to influence these moneyed secularist Hindus in any way. Uh, but so that's, that's what the situation is. So at any rate, you see, whether this has any practical consequences uh, on these lines or not, at any rate, you see, what I am here to say is that the, the, uh, the thesis by Pollock that Hinduism is the basis of national socialism, that is not correct. Dr. Elst, my next question is, um, is it true that Heinrich Himmler carried the Gita with him? Did it guide his policy? Well, yes, you see, since we are on this topic, um, let's, uh, let's face the difficult questions. And, so, you see, Hindus and all the others can uh, easily spend a lifetime without bothering about this question. But um, here and there in polemical circles, uh, it is alive and it is brought up, namely the claim and I dare say the fact that Heinrich Himmler, the head of the SS had a special uh, place in his heart for the Bhagavad Gita. So, in the case of Hitler, it is very simple. He had nothing but contempt for him. In the case of Hitler, it is more subtle. So, yes, you see, he thought India was a very dirty place and 
Indians very very mixed corrupt people and so on but you see long ago it is Aryans a branch of the pure Aryan race that entered India and so before they all ended up getting mixed racially at least they produced a few fine things and so one of these is the Bhagavad Gita and it's a, a little pocket book that you can carry with you and that's what he did very often now of course there are many people who do that but not just Hindus uh, for example, a British New Age thinker, active in the 1950s, The Outsider. This is uh, the book with which he became known. Okay, I'll, I'll come to the name. But so there are more people who had this habit of always carrying this uh, with them. And so so one of them was uh, Himmler. And... Uh, Within National Socialism, Himmler is not just anyone. If he's not a, a big talker like Goebbels or, you know, a fat art collector like Goering or so. No, no, no. He's the architect of the Holocaust. And what did this have to do with the people? Well, that was not an instruction from the Gita, of course. However, another element of it was, it is the uh, great uh, feeling for duty. You see, Arjuna is told by Krishna to do his duty. And so Himmler was, uh, was fired up with a great sense of duty. So he... Um, it's not the only thing he had from the Gita. For example, very Hindu-like, he was also a very soft person. Uh, you see, he wanted to minimize suffering. Aha! You <laughs> say, that's strange. But yes, you see, he thought that gassing was a very soft way of killing people. There's no bloody mess. You see, it doesn't, you don't feel all kinds of things. It just fairly swiftly fade out and die. And <laughs> so <laughs> that's part of the, uh, the Hindu approach he brings to it. You know, it's clean, it's, it's relatively painless, uh, you know, but nevertheless, it, it's killing. And so that killing, as as a, a mass procedure, that's definitely not from the Gita. Nevertheless, the Gita is also about killing. In an open war, you don't kill just uh, chosen victims of the wrong race. No, you kill the enemy. That's more normal. Uh, but so it's also killing, and it also justifies killing, in the sense that uh, it's not really killing, because... The enemy is going to revive one day anyway. And you yourself, if you get killed, it doesn't matter because you're going to wake up tomorrow, at least in a new body and, and start a new life. So this whole doctrine of reincarnation makes the issue of death less compelling. It relativizes death. Okay, so those are things that he thought were very useful, those ideas. But so the decisive point for him is your sense of duty. Uh, Arjuna is told to do his duty. Now, what did he think of duty? Well, there is a, a speech by him on 6th of October, 1943, in Posen, present-day Poznan in Poland. Where he speaks about, you know, we have to do our duty. We have to relieve the others from doing it for us. And so he justified this for mass killing. You see, he says, we are hard. We are not ordinary men. We are hard men. We have seen it, you know, piles of corpses. So it is for us 
to do the duty that others are to serve to do. And not half work. Like, for example, we could be sentimental vis-a-vis the children that we're going to kill and let them grow up and then let them become a problem for our children. So no, 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 we're not going to leave this problem for others. We are going to solve the problem ourselves, maybe by killing those. And so there he makes the step from being beautiful and, you know, relieving the others from having to do the dirty work. And so taking it upon yourself. And so that's in the spirit of the Gita of doing your good. And that's, that's the most important to feed that out. Then he did believe in reincarnation also, which, which is there. So those mostly. Then in the Gita, of course, is also present. Uh, but that was not the issue for him. What is present there is also a subscription to race. I mean, I know that this is a point of discussion among Hindus, whether he teaches caste by birth or not. But so for a person like uh, like Himmler, it's very easy to, to interpret it that way. Why does Arjuna have to fight? It's not that only people who feel like fighting have to fight. No, no, it's his duty. Even though he doesn't feel like fighting, he still has to fight because he's born a Kshatri. So anyway, that, that discussion about, you see, to what extent you have birth, uh, passed by birth or not. I mean, I know it's controversial concerning the Gita, but so the, the standard uh, interpretation was, yes, there's caused by birth. So that's also part of, uh, of his worldview. Not in any detail, but at least the whole idea that you're determined by birth and that therefore, you see, Germans are determined by birth to be superior, Jews are determined by birth to be inferior. So at any rate, he, uh, he liked the Gita. That's simply a historical fact. However, it's allowed to, uh, to like any of your books. There are many known Hindus who, when they read uh, the Ramayana, like the Ramayana, because, and who often give it interpretations that you wouldn't have given to it. And so they're free to do that as long as they don't, you know, impose their reading upon you. Well, what can you do? So, yes, you see that, uh, that Himmler used the Gita is not in itself any stricture against the Gita or the, the, the community of people using the Gita or the underlying ideology as a whole. On the other hand, among Hindus, I would certainly take it as uh, an occasion for really uh, contemplating the Gita and, and really thinking it through and, and you know, Going through all these problems, you see, and, and, and do what I have been trying to do now. You see, I'm trying to discuss the issue of use by Himmler of the Gita and what that means. I say it doesn't mean too much, but nevertheless, it's not me who has to say that. Actually, it's him who has to take it up themselves. And so, uh, as a friend of mine remarked to me, you see, why do you write about this? You see, how come you are the first to do so? I mean, I googled it up and so on. No Hindu has ever brought the subject. I mean, shouldn't they defend the honor of their scripture? <laughs> that I leave to you. So the next question, Dr. L says, the term Hindu Nazi rings a bell. And where exactly does it come from? Yeah, the term Hindu Nazi, that's even more explicit than Hindu fascist. The difference is this. Uh, so fascism is named after the Vasquez, the um, 
acts used as a symbol of authority by the lictor, that is to say, a, a civil servant charged with public order, let's say a, a police officer in ancient Rome. So that became the symbol of, uh, it is already the symbol since many centuries of the Swiss province of St. Gallen. But so it became that of the uh, Italian uh, fascist uh, state in 1922. And so from there you get the word fascism. And then later when Hitler introduced his national socialism, then Stalin ordered all his people to also call that fascism because he didn't want the word socialism to be tainted. His national socialism is a form of socialism. So if you would blacken national socialism, that would reflect badly on socialism. So you also use the term fascism for that. Nevertheless, in those days, nobody confused the two. Nobody would have called the German movement as fascism. And so, like, there was a an attempt to unite the different authoritarian nationalist movements in Montreux in, I think, 1932, and that didn't get anywhere. You see, they did not find common ground at all. So this is a typical national phenomenon. And so one of the differences is that in fascism, race was not important. It became important only after 1936, when Italy made a pact with Germany. Then German influence becomes palpable. But so until then, no problem uh, with uh, concepts like race. And indeed, you see later when the Germans end up occupying northern Italy and the Jews become in danger, then the fascist mayors start doing things to protect their Jews. And so also their, their, their whole attitude towards race was very different. Many of them were a bit anti-Semitic, like most Christians traditionally were, but not to the extent of, of deporting and killing them. So that was a, a big difference with National Socialism. The, the whole attitude towards uh, authority, like for instance, Italy was still a kingdom. And so Mussolini wasn't a king. You see, he was like uh, holding the power, but on behalf of the king. Whereas Germany, you know, didn't want any monarch, except that Hitler himself acted as a kind of monarch. But so, for us nowadays, this is this is a uh, a matter of detail, but back then being a monarchist or being a republican or something was a serious affair. And then their economic policies and so on. I mean, there are many differences. And so it is, in fact, a bad verbal or rhetorical habit to call the German movement fascist. But okay. Anyway, so some people do use the proper term namely Nazi, and then they applied that one to Hindus. Because you see, there's always something wrong with Hindus if they aren't Hindu fascists, then they are Hindu Nazis. Now, that term was popularized on some scale by the um, paper Dalit Voice. I, I studied it in the 90s. I, I guess it still exists. Um, and so it's born from a very bizarre uh, combination of positions. So of course, it's anti-Hindu, but it's also anti-Jewish. And so it calls the Hindus sometimes Hindu Nazis, but it sometimes also calls them Jews of India. And in 2005, when in Tehran, there was a... Um, revisionist conference hosted by the Iranian government uh, to deny the Holocaust and so on. Well, they were also present. 
this, this paper Dolly course was also there. to fulminate against the Hindus. <laughs> Nobody else probably understood what this was all about. But so they um, claim to speak for the low caste. Of course, the founder of the paper was not a Dali at all. But okay, so that's more or less where ideologically it's situated. And so you can compare it to today's Twitter polls. You see that, that kind of pamphlet level. The last question for you, Dr. Elf, is what to think of those scholars who deem Hinduism as being Nazi or Nazism? How do you deal with these scholars? Having just compared that level of discourse with Twitter polls, I uh, don't think I have expressed any high regard for it. So, um, if uh, actual scholars stood to that level, that that doesn't speak well for them. Um, there are some scholars that have a more sophisticated discourse, like. Um, here, for instance, you have uh, Christoph Zafralo, and so his uh, book about Narendra Modi is Hindu Nationalism and the Rise of Ethnic Democracy. So ethnic democracy, also called electoral autocracy, means the idea that, yeah, the forms of democracy are observed, but what's happening is really something else. Now, of course, the world over, parliamentary democracies are really manipulated by powers that be, and so that's not something typical Indian or, or American or what. You see, that's always a problem. That's always a, a task for Democrats, you see, to, to be on guard against these tendencies. But, um, that's already a far more measured language than to shout about uh, Nazism, fascism. So you have these uh, these explanations of India being something in informed democratic, but a bit authoritarian, which you know is a, is a, is a, a good discussion. Uh, only, of course, uh, we know that India was like that before uh, the BJP. Thank you, Dr. S. Now we go to questions from our audience members. Namaste, Kanraji. Thank you so much. Uh, have you seen this book? It's by Pandit Satish Sharma. Conversion and of Conversion of Polonia. Yeah, class and conversion. And yes, history, yes, okay, okay. Uh, yeah. What do you think of this um, idea that caste is a British um, invention? Well, I disagree. Conversion is not a colonial conspiracy because conversion has been an aim of the church since the beginning. And similarly, race is not uh, a colonial concoction is race, uh, I mean caste, sorry, caste existed since well before colonization. And um, even the word caste was not necessarily there, but the phenomenon of jati was very much there. And so you can say that the British, through the census operations, through the beginning of reservation policies, hardened the relation between caste, the importance that caste had for people, but that they invented it is certainly not true. You see, that, that's, that's a Hindu way of making it easy on themselves. You see, a every society has problems from the past or in the present that it has to deal with. And so Hindu society has to deal with caste. Maybe caste is a good thing and they have to keep it, or maybe it's a bad thing, they have to abolish it, or maybe, and very probably, something in between. But at any rate, they can't deny the fact. So, no, I, 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 I disagree with uh, that author. You see, neither was conversion 
the novelty nor the stars the novelty. Thank you, Dr. Els. Uh, I propose to Rajaniji's question. I have a little doubt, with, if I may ask. So, uh, about this whole Jati and the Varna system. As you know, in the Gita, Sri Krishna, he says that all the Varnas are in me. And I am, the uh, uh, in all the Varnas, you know, you find me. And so he says many other things also together with that. Now also in the Purush Sutta, it says that all these are parts of the same Purush. Yes, of course. Now, uh, the thing is that isn't this a concept of, uh, I mean, this is not found in the European uh, or the American slavery concept. They believe that the slaves are totally outside and they are, you know, the dirty ones and this and that. But here you have this uh, source of equality coming from these documents that they come from the same source only. And uh, it's just a symmetrical way of telling that from the start from the head to the down. You don't go from top to the bottom. So, I mean, the source is of equality, but that is lacking in the concept of the European and American. So, yes. What? So, well, let me, let me repeat. If Hitler absolutely needed to legitimize inequality, he absolutely need not have uh, gone to India. You see, that justification is exactly present in Europe too. And um, the, namely the Purusha Sutta is, is almost literally present in a Roman tradition where Meninius Agrippa uh, in the Roman Republic, he belongs to the elite. And so the, the popular class is, is saying, yeah, but you see, it's like in a body, the, uh, you know, the, the brain cells have it easy. You see, they sit there nicely inside. They don't have to work, whereas the, the, the cells in the leg and in the stomach and so on they have to work. And so Menini Sarifa says, well, you see, what would you do without this system? I mean, everybody needs everybody. And so, you see, everybody has different things to do, but they're all necessary, not only for themselves, but for all. And so that's the, that's the uh, tradition of corporatism, likening the whole of society to the human body. Now, a later Roman citizen took over this idea, and you might have heard of him, Saint Paul. And so he also uses the, the same simile. He also says to people that they're like one body, they should all cooperate. And he does it even explicitly to justify slavery. He says, you are all, you know, <laughs> slaves and free men, you are all free in Christ. You know, I mean, <laughs> that is some consolation for the slaves. Well, I'm still a slave, but in Christ I'm free. Yeah. Uh, so, at any rate, inequality is very much there, even in, in, in very sharp form of slavery. But so it can be accommodated in the available image of everybody working together like the cells of a body. So that's corporatism, that's present in the Purusha Sutta, but that's also present in the social teachings of the church. In fact, which do go by the name corporatism, and which were in fact used as a social philosophy by Mussolini, by Italian fascism, and by numerous other countries in the Catholic uh, ambit. So, no, it's not true that Europe doesn't have this, no. You know, you have the same thing, this is probably of Indo-European origin, or it may go even beyond that. Uh, like in China, there is also such a myth of uh, some giant who, uh, you know, who has all the, the body parts, you know, becoming the parts of the universe. In fact, with this little detail, that the lice on his body become the human beings on the body of Mother Earth. The lice, that's us. <laughs> anyway, so it's obvious that this 
this relativizing of inequality, this justifying of inequality in a harmony model, that's pretty universal. One more system, I mean, you saw the Hindu Sahi rulers, they were Brahmin. Uh, you saw Satrapati Shivaji was a Shudra and he became a Kshatriya. So there was this kind of fluidity amongst the Varnas which later on yeah. became rigid. So, I mean, could you explain this phenomenon? The Varna system was not very fixed in, in real social terms. You see, mostly the jatis were fixed in the sense that you remained in your jati. So the Peshwas, for example, the um, those who effectively uh, spread Shivaji's rebellion to the rest of India created a, a large Maratha empire. So those Peshwas were born Brahmins, Chittavan Brahmins, and even though they played a martial role par excellence of conquest, they were never known as anything except Brahmins. So rather than to say, ah, because they take a Kshatriya function, they become Kshatriyas, no, 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 no. You see, even Brahmins in some circumstances can take a Kshatriya practical function, but they remain Brahmins. You know, it's very important because nowadays among Hindu apologists, you have these people who, who pretend that uh, this is a matter of choice. That you see, at some point in puberty, you know, people make a choice. Oh, I want to be, you know, just like today, you know, I want to be an airplane pilot. Okay. So, so in those days, at some point, they, they made a choice. I want to be a Kshatriya. No, that's not how it went, you see. By that time, just by learning from your father, if he was a Kshatriya, you already had become a Kshatriya. And... Uh, so even if it's not only by birth, but also by nurture, well, birth and, you know, nature and nurture conspire. They work in the same direction to make you go into the footsteps of your ancestors. I have, uh, first of all, a question about ideological influences and analysis of, of uh, Sheldon Pollock. So... Sheldon Pollock has come up with something called deep orientalism. Yes. And on the one hand, we have people like uh, Professor Vishwa Suri actually defending it in some context. Yes. Uh, and you call yourself an orientalist, so I thought you might be the best person to comment on deep orientalism and why Dr. Vishwa Adluri should be defending him when, in fact, Vishwa Adluri's nay science is full of how Germans transposed or German Indologists transposed all the racial fantasies onto the Bhagavad Gita, the Vedas, the Mahabharata, and so on. And second question is, what is the influence of the writings of Nietzsche on the Nazis, especially when it went through his sister's hands? And thirdly, for Nazis to be, uh, you know, influenced into committing genocide, don't you think the Bible is a more immediate source of those ideas with a clearly chosen people, you know, exterminating the natives and then establishing a new kingdom? Mm -hmm. this, this is my question. About Orientalism, yes, my position there is, is quite well known. I am an Orientalist. And so, the word um, Orientalism is a perfectly innocent uh, term. It, it denotes classic studies, not of uh, the Romans and the Greeks, but farther beyond to the East. And from there on, it's a very big field. You see, the classical uh, Oriental departments had an, an Arab section, an Iranian section, a Japanese section, and so on. Very interesting. But so, Orientalism originally denotes a discipline. And so, in 
Germany this September. You have been so many as conference, uh, Orientalist conference, or what is called there, Deutsche Orientalistentag. So this is just called Orientalisten, the study of the Orient. And it has no colonial connotation or so. This has been started by Edward Said. Edward Said was a Zimi, literally. He was a Palestinian Christian who spent his whole intellect in the service of Islam. And so he always defends Islam, like he says that the press about Islam is far too negative, it should be more positively. This is 1973, I think when there was still criticism of Islam. Nowadays, you don't find that anymore. So anyway, it's in that context that he launches this notion of Orientalism, where he sees Orientalism, where he reduces the, the really existing Orientalism to just a, a tool of colonial domination. Now, you see the the, uh, the, the center of gravity of Orientalism was the German-speaking part of Europe, at least academically German-speaking, that is including Hungary and so on. And so all, all the great ideas come from there. Now, they had no colonial interest in any part of Asia. So, and even from England and France, you see, many scholars were distrusted by their own authority. Because they uh, they went native, because they identified with their object of study, and so <laughs> it's just not true that there were only instruments in in the hands of the authorities. So uh, from then on, the word Orientalism is a bit compromised, and so it's from that compromised notion of Orientalism that. Pollock makes a, a little personal variety with this deep orientalism. So yeah. that's, 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 that's not Pollock's fault. You see, that's just, uh, most of, uh, Anglo-Saxon orientalism <laughs> acquires this negative notion of orientalism. What is uh, Dr. Vishwa Adlodi's point about this deep orientalism and what is so deep about this orientalism? I mean, I would like to know. I mean, Orientalism is fine enough. The study of the Orient, that's good enough. But what is yes. about it? And why is Dr. Vishwa Duri supporting it? And of course, about Nietzsche and the high influence on the Nazis. Yeah, yeah. Well, about uh, Abluri, I've written about it, but that's years ago, and I don't remember exactly. At any rate, you see, he has this. Uh, rather original position within the Indian field of scholarship where he, uh, you know, is quite Western, is quite uh, present in, in Western traditions and so on, and at the same time anti-Western. And so there you have the whole critique of 19th century German Indology and so on. Now, where that um, convergence with uh, Pollock precisely fits in, I, I can no longer e explain to you. As for Nietzsche, that I know quite well. So Nietzsche didn't get anything from India. Like a few intellectuals at the time, he he knew about the recently published uh, translations of some Indian texts, which he himself mostly had not read, but they were like in the intellectual air. And so his knowledge of Indian traditions is very little. And so they have little impact on his uh, ideas that might have interested the Nazis. If you mean caste, he does write on caste, but this is all borrowed from not so serious writer is Jacques Liu, uh, who had this idea that the 
the Jews were related to the Chandalas, which is the low caste in India, and that's so the uh, I mean the practical impact at any rate is that the um, Jews should end up in Europe down below, the way the Chandalas end up in India down below. Now, Nietzsche is rather um, moderate about this, and he doesn't want to have anything to do with the rising tide of anti-Semitism in his day, not with nationalism in general, and in particular, and he writes it also to his friends, you see, in particular, this, this new wave of anti-Semitism, he does not want to be associated with it. He says it very emphatically. But so after he went uh, insane and then died, it's his sister who took over his legacy. And so she was very selective and... Uh, so her husband was entirely part of this new nationalism and anti-Semitism. And so it is that version of Nietzsche that has percolated to uh, Nazi attention. But so the real Nietzsche has not much influence the Nazis. It is the colored Nietzsche that has. But so he cannot be held responsible for all the ideas that, that have been associated with him. I have written about this in detail. There's a paper of mine, uh, uh, Manu as a, what is it, as an excuse for the defense of inequality, something like that. It's about Manu, and Nietzsche about Manu. And finally, the influence of the Bible on Nazi actions. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you'd have to ask them. But it's true that there is, there is a genocide in the Bible. When Joshua enters the promised land, he kills everyone. And, and like even when, when, when his men come home and have not killed anyone, then he punishes them or he sends them back to go completely kill him. Or earlier, there is King Saul who gets the command from God to kill some particular population, and then he's punished, he's deposed as king, precisely because he fails to kill all of them. And so, yeah, there, there is some genocide in the Bible, too. But I don't think that the, um, that the Nazis took Yahweh as justification. Not probably. But so, at any rate, it was on their horizon. And so this is another reason why they didn't need inspiration from India for them. First, because it wasn't there. Secondly, because they didn't need it. Yeah, I have lots of questions, but uh, you know, I don't know what the time is. I mean, the time is only one and a half hours. <laughs> no, it's okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so one of the things about this uh, Nietzsche again, is that he comes up with this concept of Uberman. Yes. The Superman. And, uh, you know, Will Durant says that whoever reads Nietzsche's book about Uberman cannot help thinking that he himself, that is the reader, is the destined Superman, Uberman. Mm -hmm. Will Durant makes this comment. Don't you think that would have had, a, especially when Nazis came up with this idea of Aaron Folk, would that not be directly in line with the Ubermensch, or is it philosophically very different? No, the, the concept of Ubermensch has little to do with the superior race. Okay. The idea of superior race is almost at cross purposes. Everybody can become the Ubermensch. All kinds of other um, explanations for it have been given, including Perhaps quite interesting here, uh, not for the link with the Nazis, but for the link with India, is precisely that this is the enlightened human being, the Buddha. But that is the Ubermans. But in him, you see, all the potential of human beings has been completed. 
Then we, you bring in notions of karma and so on. He's been purified of the karma and so on. Then it makes sense from from that angle. And so, so there are there are um, individuals in this probably schools of thought that uh, interpret Ibrahim's this way. But so he didn't conceive it as, as a superior race. He was, uh, he was very well aware of race thinking and he made it a point to distance himself from it. As for the Bible, since you bring it up, well, um, it's of course a paradox that Christians, Protestants at least, have taken over and revived the Old Testament. Which you see Catholics keep in their Bible but never read. And except you see a few selected parts that the church has chosen and that are read out in church every Sunday morning. And, and that's it, you see. And so they often don't know these parts. Like, for example, the French priest Abbe Pierre, well known leftist priest, died some years ago. Um, he testifies that he had already finished his studies for the priesthood, he was like in the last year of seminary, when he discovered for the first time that there is genocide in the Old Testament. You see, Catholics never read these passages, whereas Protestants do. Again, in, in that way, you see, Protestants are much closer to the roughness of the Old Testament. And have put into practice what the Jews, because of their nervous minority position, couldn't do. They they could put it in practice in their conquests in America and South Africa and so on. Like the roughness of slavery, even when slavery was going out of fashion, because of the Bible, you see, they kept on practicing slavery. So that that roughness is there now. The Protestants brought back. Uh, scenes and, and attitudes from the Old Testament that, that had gone dormant. And so maybe you could say, well, there is a certain influence in the mentalities of this uh, biblical legacy that made genocide thinkable. Now that's, that's uh, a, a tall order. I'm not making that case, but I suppose it, it could be made, I suppose someone has made it. It is very interesting that you should talk about, you should say that the Uber mensch is an individual, not a race, because, uh, you know, Ananda Kumaraswamy came to the same conclusion and he said that the Uber mensch is what we in Indian tradition call Jeevan Mukta. Okay. In fact, he makes that explicit statement. So mm -hmm. that's very interesting. And I wanted to ask you about all these uh, stories floating around about uh, uh, Hitler's Pope, uh, you know, being complicit in the genocide and so on and so forth. How, how true or believable are these things about the close collusion between the Vatican and Hitler, Hitler's regime? No. Yeah, yeah, that's um, that's a fairly common theory. I disagree with it. The uh, Catholic Church uh, tried to steer a middle course. You see, their whole flock was, in fact, within the Nazi Empire or its allies. And so they didn't want to take them on frontally. They also thought this was not very wise, that it would only harden the Nazis. Like you had the case of uh, Edith Stein, a Catholic nun of Jewish origin. So she was arrested and sent to uh, the death camps after the Dutch Catholic bishops had protested against the Nazis. And so the Nazis cracked down on them and were to show them uh, they arrested Jews of Catholic origin. Who had been protected until then by being Catholic. You see, then they were just reminded of their Jewish birth and rounded up. So, you see, the Pope at the time thought that this could happen on a larger scale, on a more serious scale, uh, if we provoke them too much. 
so instead, you see what happened was that many monasteries and so on were thrown up or Catholic institutions, uh, you know, were used to hide uh, Jews and so on. So he did a lot to protect the Jews. Um, you know, th that he consciously collaborated with the, um, the Holocaust is absolutely not true. However, it is true that some parts of the church, like the Croatian Istasha regime, did collaborate, uh, not just militarily collaborate, but did collaborate with the Holocaust. So the, the, the Catholic picture is not, uh, not all innocent, but to speak of like Hitler's Pope, you know, that's, uh, that's cheap propaganda. Anyway, that's far from, you know, in that connection, I am rather reminded of that Maharaja in India who saves all these Polish children. You see, there was some shipload of uh, Polish refugees and nobody wanted them and they kept sailing and sailing until finally some Indian Maharaja accepted them and took care of them. So that's the Indian spirit. Let's say that's the Hindu spirit. That's what Hindus also do for, you know, Kerala Christians and for Parsis. So uh, that's a better example. Hindu dharma is the same. Another question comes to mind. Uh, Hitler did not have a uniform view of all Europeans. Hitler also said that there were gradations and the Teutons were obviously the best. Mm -hmm. And uh, Slavs and other people were sort of second rate. Yeah. So, but, uh, and yet he received, I think, some collaboration from the Balkan Muslims, and also I think from Serbia or Croatia, it is the Stasi or something. I forget the name. So, and uh, how far did these collaborations go with uh, Muslims, or especially of European origin? Yes, you mean the Ustasha. The oh, regime sorry. of Croatia, which included Bosnia, so it has a large Muslim population. Like they had a, a large uh, mosque in Zagreb, which later when the communists uh, conquered the area was turned into a food stand. But, um, so yeah, the, the Muslims wholeheartedly collaborated. Uh, those from Bosnia, from Albania some parts of the uh, Caucasus and this was uh, motivated by the um, the guy from Jerusalem, the Mufti, Mufti of Jerusalem. So there was some, some serious collaboration and they were punished for it by uh, Stalin or by wherever, you know, whatever communist regimes took over, like the, the Crimea Tartars, for example. That's another Muslim population that collaborated. And so they were, after the Soviet, uh, well, liberation, they were punished for it, they were deported. So there was a certain, um, a certain understanding between Islam and Nazism. Uh, which Hitler also reciprocated, and Himmler especially. Himmler was all in favor of Islam. I mean, of course, both Hitler and Himmler thought this was all obsolete, these religions. Uh, but nevertheless, among the religions, Islam was the best because it had two properties that were most to the liking of the Nazis. Namely, they promoted uh, militarism, they were masculine religions, and they promoted procreation. So, you see, the German state policy at the time was also geared to having many children and then giving them a very martial education. So Hitler uh, made sure that all the soldiers who died in battle of Muslim origin got a Muslim burial. And, you know, to the extent possible, you know, their rules of uh, food and so on were taken into account. 
with all this kind of evidence and with so many connections of different types to, to Hitler's regime, how does uh, Pollock specifically zero in on Hinduism as the reason for everything that's happened almost to the exclusion of everything else? That is something surprising. You might say that in one aspect contributed more or less to the end result. But how does he say that this is the root of everything? That is... Uh, well, yeah, because Hinduism has the aura of being very fundamental. And so, you know, you have inequality everywhere, but the, an elaborate doctrine of inequality, the caste system, now for that you have to be in India. That's not entirely true. Like, for instance, Plato had this whole doctrine of the perfect state, and she also had a layered society. And so, to quite an extent, he could have had it in Europe. And found it in Europe. And indeed, he, Hitler himself was a great admirer of Greece. You know, even though he was not an intellectual, he must have heard about Plato's uh, specific teaching, which is also partly why uh, Karl Popper, uh, a liberal philosopher, you know, traces totalitarianism to Plato. He probably also doesn't know about Mimata's philosophy, but in a way he does not bring it into the picture. He traces it to Plato. And so, the, in fact, there is a, another modern book, the, um, by Huxley, Brave New World, where you do find that, uh, reproduced, there is these, uh, different layers in society. So yes, you are, you absolutely don't need any inspiration for India from this. Uh, but you know, in the case of Pollock, he was motivated by an anti-Hindu animus, you know, which is very candid. And so uh, that probably explains it. At any rate, I think he, um, he uh, I mean, I don't want to meddle, you know, he does what he wants. But strictly speaking, I think he ought to tender an apology to Hindu society and clearly take distance from his own mistaken position of 30 years ago. You know, comparing philosophies or ideologies, how well does uh, the Chinese legalistic system fit in with Nazi notions of how the state should function? People talk about fascism and there you have obedience to the state. So, uh, are there any organic similarities between these two? Well, it didn't play any role in Nazi thinking that I know of. In, in terms of, uh, feeling it leaves you with is quite similar because it's a very repressive system. You see, in China, you on the one hand have Confucianism, which tries to rule by example and by common culture and, you know, by listening to the same music or playing the same music and so on creating a community spirit, whereas the legalists don't care about that. There's a question of firm rules and and heavy punishment if you don't follow them, and that will impose harm on you. But so I don't think that they have played any role in uh, Nazi Germany. Now we had Rajani Sharma here a little while back. Uh, there is no such word as caste uh, in Hinduism. The British collapsed, forced professions of Jati into caste. When the British came to India, the majority of the kings were Shudras. And the Britishers criminalized those Jatis who fought back their efforts and they created the uh, Criminal Tribes Act. And uh, Hitler called uh, the symbol Hack and Cruz the uh, hook. <coughs> the Pope also supports Hitler as Christian. So these, uh, this was saying that there was no such word as caste. In Hinduism, British collapsed it, forced Jati into caste, and uh, they created the Criminal Tribes uh, Act to further their cause. And so the Pope also su uh, supports Hitler as a Christian with the Pope. Well, 
Well, that's a bit confused, I'm afraid. Uh, yes, you see, there are certainly criticism possible of the uh, Criminal Crimes Act, but um, those um, those mistakes don't alter the basic truth of the um, their perception that this was a caste society. And the Portuguese had, had the same perception for you some years earlier. And um, and the Mahabharata people had the same perception even earlier. And so it's their descriptions about caste that, to my mind, prove the existence of caste, which was not as crude and not as cruel and so on as it was made out to be. And there are all kinds of things to say in correction of the views that have become established. Nevertheless, the Hindu apologetic uh, position that caste was created by outsiders, that just can't stand. You see, caste grew gradually in India. First, there was no caste in the Rig Veda, no caste. Not even in the Purusha Sukta, you know, considered by friend and foe as the basis of the caste system. Actually, there's no caste in there. There are only four functions in society, and it is not said how these functions are recruited. You see, do people have to, you know, be born somewhere to be there, and do they have to marry only one another, and do they have to follow the same profession as their father? And so on. You see, that is all not implied in the Purusha Sutta. Uh, so caste is not there, not even in that one verse. Then it uh, took shape gradually. First, in a patrilineal form, you were of the same caste as your father, but the caste of your mother didn't matter. Then later, that changed also, and so father and mother had to be from the same caste. And then that became the norm, not just in the elite, but in the whole of society about 200 AD, according to the geneticists. You see that from then on, the Indian population is really divided in, you know, box type groupings of castes. So caste is not intrinsic to Hinduism. You know, if you want to make that apologetic point that there is an Hinduism without caste, that's entirely true. And indeed, you see, in some of the diaspora communities, caste has disappeared and still they're very firm Hindus. But on the other hand, it is also true that for about 2,000 years of history, caste has been very present. And so you can't divorce Hinduism entirely from the phenomenon of caste. Regarding the Purusha Sukta, I just wanted to point out that the way we find it expressed there, it is almost as if Varnas are already there. And uh, what the Purusha Sukta is trying to do is have a harm, harmonious idea of the Varnas by attributing different parts of the Purusha to each Varna. Because clearly the word is Asi, which means walls. Brahmano Asya Mukham Asi means that Brahmana became. So it means that Brahmins already existed. Kshatriyas, these categories already existed and it is merely integrating them into the into its vision. Mm -hmm. That is the way one would see it. Whereas if you look in the Bible, during when the Israelite society is just being created, you see clearly that a group is being deputed as Kohen. You don't see that kind of deputation in the uh, Purusha Sutta at all, because that is a formative stage. Here, what you see is a description of a mature stage. That mm -hmm. is what I think it is. And so, uh, you are right that caste has been coming along with Hinduism and it may even predate the Purusha Sutta. At least in the form of four Varnas. We don't know about mm -hmm. Jati. But at least in the form of four Varnas, that is place. And secondly, uh, interesting thing is that uh, the Pope himself recognized through the bull of, I think, 1623, all the caste privileges for converts. 
which yes, was one of the expanse of the Jesuits. And this was way before any colonial power took foothold in any major way in India. So caste was an aspect of society. It may have had you know, different types of effects, but that's a different issue altogether. Mm -hmm. But that it was present is pretty clear. Yes, agreed. Uh, by the way, the audience may not have understood the word Kohen. Kohen in Judaism means a priestly class. And uh, a Kohen has to be a, a purest possible Jew, like Kohanim are not supposed to intermarry. Whereas other Jews, you know, they have some certain acceptance of intermarriage, though they can only become full Jews after some generations. They have to be pure enough, so Kohanim have to be totally pure. And um, there are more similarities with Brahmins in India. Like they're not supposed to be present at time of uh, uncleanliness, namely of death. Because they have to be kept away from corpses. The same is true, for instance, of the Roman priests. The, the Flamen, the Alis, also has to be kept pure. And so, uh, in India, this, this notion of untouchability is linked with that. You see, the, the Brahmin has to be kept away from dirtying activities, has to be kept away from polluting influences like death. And so there is this uh, shunning of people who are closer to the death phenomenon, like a washerman or a barber, you see, deals with uh, body hair, for example, that is decomposing. You see, any body element or body fluid that starts decomposing is counts as impure. There is a death uh, uh, aura hanging over it, and so Brahmin should stay away from there. The purity is, is away from there. And so th that's the basis of untouchability. Uh, a scholar called uh, Gary Hart once uh, has shown it to be originating in in South India. So it has nothing to do with the Aryanization. It's uh, very much, uh, very much there, and not where you would expect it with or without Aryanization. The uh, notion of Aryan versus anyone else just does not come into the picture. It is totally native. Now, Dr. Elts, I heard uh, a kind of, I don't know, Madhu Kishwar, she, one of her, uh, she read somewhere, I don't know, she told me this, that uh, in the Indian concept, uh, context, the feet are never considered as dirty. I mean, uh, you wash Bhagawan's feet and you drink the Charnamrit. When you touch, mm -hmm. you touch the feet of the elder. You don't touch their head. And so the feet has always been given a very uh, purified stand, which doesn't happen in Islam, because in Islam, below the ankle is called dirty. So they mm -hmm. wear those high pajamas above the ankle. And in uh, Christianity also, there's no such concept of the feet. The feet is always, uh, I mean, it's not mentioned, but they don't mm -hmm. do it. So uh, when the sudras are considered as the feet, it's just that it's uh, like Professor R. Rajanathan has written this book, Caste as a Social Capital. Yes. Uh, just like you have division of labor in offices, you cannot make everybody sit on the same uh, feet. Mm -hmm. So similarly, these things were classified in those fashion. Later on, it might have got corrupt, but the origin is at least not uh, something. I mean, I would Yeah, like no, I mean, on this, of course, I keep learning, especially from Madhu Kishwar. You see, she has this very, very nativist uh, perspective, uh, bringing in all these, uh, well, subaltern perspectives that, that I don't know about. So I keep learning. You see, on that I have nothing to add, but, you know, it's, it's interesting and very probably true. About the basic uh, issue that we're talking about today, namely uh, the allegation that there is something profoundly Nazi and Hinduism, I think we can conclude that that is not true. You see, Hindu, Hinduism is always very measured as a sense of proportion. 
You see, now it has it does not have equality, but it has a sense of proportion. This is totally missing in the excesses that Nazism is known for. You know, are about extremism. So um, I, I I hope we can lay that uh, slander to rest.